Hey everyone, welcome back to MaggieBot's Top 100 Games of All Time. We are on video number 4, which is my breakdown of number 70 through 61. And as I'm getting farther and farther away from making these slides, it's getting more and more fun to kind of rediscover the list after I made it, if that makes sense. Um, so this last video was actually the most fun I had recording one, so I'm expecting big things now. Uh, so let's take a quick look. Number 70. Um, that is The Prodigal's Club. Uh, it's a 2015 release from Check games edition. Um, this is by Vladimir Suki, the same guy that did um, Shipyard and Last Will, which Prodigal's Club is a, I want to say it's kind of the predecessor of Last Will because Prodigal's Club was a little closer to the original build, which they asked him to kind of pare down because, let me just tell you, Prodigal's Club is the closest thing I can think of in a game to spinning plates. You are working on these three different sections of the board like it has on the bottom of this picture here and you need to do as best you can on all of these tracks because only one of them is going to go out but your score is dependent on how well how, how poorly you did in any one track and i i like games that do that they kind of incentivize you to do a little bit of everything even though most games and engine builders want you to just kind of focus on one or two tracks this one is really interesting um, fun fact, I spent a little bit of Last Gen Con teaching this game, and unfortunately the first group that I taught, I got one rule just completely wrong, and I, I still feel bad to this day. I pre-apologize if you're out there watching someone. <sighs> I'll never get over that, but, um, it's, it's quite fun. This is another of the top hundred I don't own anymore because I lost it in the breakup, but, um, it is quite fabulous and really fun, and the player count scales pretty well. I think I, I preferred it at three the best, but it was pretty fun on all counts. Uh, number 69 is a classic. It's Goa. I played second edition. I did not ever play the first, but that was re-released in 2012. This is the Rudiger Dorn title, who you may know from about a million other games, but his biggest claim to fame these days is probably Istanbul. Um, this was a Z-Man Games, like, new edition, and it had, like, four new tiles, and that was, like, the biggest difference. But what Goa has that's probably the most interesting part of it um, is kind of this, like, tiling bidding track thingy. And I just thought that that was so neat. Like, you build these tiles next to each other, and that kind of tells you the next thing that's bid on. And, um... Everything about it was pretty good. Um, this is another one I don't own that I did own at one point. I gifted it uh, to someone who loves it more than me, but it is, there's plenty of copies around and I definitely play it here and there at cons and at friends' houses. Number 68 is 51st State, The New Era. This is a 2011 um, reimagining of 51st State. Um, this was uh, Ignacy wanted to kind of clean up the first version because 51st state was pretty darn rough if you played the first version of it and so this one kind of got rid of the leaders and um changed up some of the cards this game more than most games is pretty wild and crazy the 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 hits are just bigger so if you've ever played imperial settlers and you felt that it was a little bit swingy imagine that but even greater. So once you get your engine going, the person that dominates in this game is really going to dominate. And I don't think I ever played it much at three or four players because it really just felt like two players. Um, this was like an early Portal Games game, but it really sold me that they were going to be doing something interesting if you could just get past their rule books. And they still, I don't think they've really figured out rule books yet. Um, one of these days. Number 67. Oh, this picture's all blurry, too. Uh, this is Kennet, uh, 2011 release from Madigo Games. Um, this is designed by Guillaume Montiage and Jacques Berriot. I don't know if that's how you pronounce either of their names, but I went for it. Uh, Madigo makes some of the prettiest games, and this by far has some of my favorite components and kind of a dudes on the map game. But it also has this really kind of almost famous now tech tree of tiles. So you level up your pyramids, which give you access to tiles, and then you take the tiles and kind of build out your engine that way. And it has some of the least obnoxious combat rules in any dudes on a map game I know of. So that's really what I love about it is that it's pretty 
traditional like rank and file war game, but spun on its head and made into something a little more Yuri feeling. Also, Drop Dead Gorgeous didn't hurt it. Um, another one that I don't own. Wow, this this section of the list apparently is things I regret not buying at some point, but um, I have plenty of games, so that's okay. <laughs> Kim, it's so fabulous, and it plays really, really well. I like it best at two and four, but it does have rules for three players, and um, I just, I, I think I preferred it for. Uh, number 66, uh, this is a little known game um, called Ortis Arena, which is now going just by Ortis. Um, it is not Ortis Regni, which came out the same year, unfortunately. This is a 2013 two-player abstract game. Um, this came out and was being kind of promoted the year that I went to my first Essen, only Essen so far. Um, this was a publisher called Fablesmith, and they were in Hall 4, which at the time was pretty, or maybe even Hall 3, but they were just kind of in the back, out of the way, kind of over by the, like, decorative miniatures and people that hadn't been at Essen before. So um, I sat down and I played against them, and this game is... It's beautiful in some ways, like the cover art and a lot of the rules and some of the 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 things inside the game are really beautiful. And then the pieces are just really ugly. And they have these little plastic hats, and I think this was even kickstarted. But the gameplay for an abstract is really fun, really difficult, challenging, um, and it just, um, especially when you play the advanced variants, are really interesting. And recently they put it onto Steam. I haven't yet played the Steam version of it, but I did play their original tablet build that they made a while back, and it was really good. So um, I, I'm probably going to pick this up on Steam at some point. I think I even have a review code if I want to do a review for it, but I haven't been able to dedicate the time yet. Um, so really, really cool abstract. If you're in Europe, you might be able to find a copy. I know they have a new game coming out, which uh, looks a little goofier than this. This one's pretty darn difficult and strategic, and it looks like they're putting out some lighter fare coming up. Uh, number 65 is Traders of Osaka. This says 2006 because it was based off of the game Traders of Carthage. Traders of Osaka was kind of a reinvention of this from, I think, 2015. Um, just updated the art a little bit, and it's much more beautiful, in my opinion, now. It's a two to four player game designed by Susumu Kawasaki. And um, I, I included one of the publishers, Kawasaki Factory, because it sounds like it's his own publishing company, but Z-Man brought it into the States. Um, Traders of Osaka is one of those strange games similar to like a, even like a Ponzi scheme or something where you're teaching it and people don't quite understand what it's all about until you're halfway in. And when you're really new at this game, it feels super random. I, I believe in my little heart of hearts. It's not that random because I, I win this a lot more than I lose it. Um, because it's, it's a very mean game. You're seeing colors of cards come up and you can kind of pull certain colors out of the deck. You can influence which colors move along this little track thing and you're trying to crash other people's merchandise by giving yourself the best bet of scoring your merchandise. It's a very interesting dynamic game and I thought the scaling between two to four players was interesting. Uh, three or four is probably my favorite player count. Uh, 64. Oh, this is um, Spirium. Uh, this is from 2013. It's a two to five player little worker placement game from William Attia, published by Eastari. Um, William Attia is best known for Kalos, and kind of only known for Kalos because before Spirium, he didn't have any other published titles except for Kalos and Kalos Magna Carta. So Spirium came out, and I was so excited about this one. I honestly. My little naive brain thought, oh, people must be pining for him to do other games because Kalos is so cool and different. It was kind of like the original big worker placement game. And when Spirium came out, it just didn't really hit with anyone. I think the almost steampunk aesthetic at the, at the, at, of the, t the board and everything else in the game kind of put people off. They're like, oh, it's one of those steampunk games. And this was, at the very height of all the steampunk mania in board games, um, Spirium and Planet Steam, I think both kind of clunked onto the scene at the same time. Um, but Spirium, in its in its little way, has some really interesting mechanisms. You you have 
things down on the board and you place your meeples and it's like spatially where you have the most meeples, you'll get access to things and your engine doesn't build up till toward the end of the game when it really starts taking off and it's just a really well done game and I don't think because I'm not so big on theme or aesthetics that that really stopped me from really enjoying the game. Good bad news is that I saw a lot of copies of Spirium going for like 10, 15 bucks at one point. So I think a lot of people own it, but haven't played it. But once it gets played around a lot more, I do think it'll become one of those, oh, I should have grabbed that game. I hope you all have a copy. And if you don't, take a look around if you can find one cheap. It's really a neat little game and it does play pretty well from two to four. I can't remember playing it a lot at five, but um, I'm sure it's just a little too crowded, but I'm sure it's fine. Uh, number 63 is Railroad Revolution. It's brand new. <laughs> uh, this is a 2016 title. Two to four players from What's Your Game. You'll notice that there are lots of What's Your Game games on my list. Um, this was designed by Marco and Stefania. Um, this is the same group that made, I believe, Zangao um, for What's Your Game. And quite frankly, the game is not quite what it appears to be. It's action selection, so you're putting kind of little houses out on the Western Union, or you're putting houses out and, and rails onto the board, and the first person to clear all the wood off of their little player board um, triggers the end of the game, and then you get one more round. And the game ramps up really fast. Everyone thinks, oh, okay, it's going to be pretty long, uh, involved Euro it looks like one. It's like a $50 box, like one of those big fantasy flight boxes. And um, you put it out, you explain it, and then about an hour later, the game is over. And I really like the depth of strategy in this for being so short. Um, there's one strategy that, though I won't call it a dominant strategy, I'll call it the easiest strategy. There's one that everyone kind of fights for, which is getting down to the, the left-hand side of the board with all the little, like, five-level things. It's totally beatable. It's just more tricky. It's it's harder to do. So it took us a couple games to really not see someone go for that only. Number 62. Okay, this is kind of a tease. This is Strasbourg from 2011. This is my second Feld on the list. Uh, now, Strasbourg never came out in the States, so not a lot of people out here have played it. Um, it's interesting and different and really hard to describe. <laughs> Um, this is published by Pegasus Spiel. In it, um, the kind of like very unique part of this game is that you are given a stack of cards. You know, uh, turn zero, you have a stack of cards. And each round, you can use as many of those cards as you want. But as the game goes by, you'll have fewer and fewer and fewer. So you have to choose when you're going to kind of like press it and use a couple extra that round for bidding and when you're going to be more conservative um because the last thing that you want is to have not used enough cards over the course of the game to really score points and be like kind of flooded in cards in the last round where you just win everything i mean it's good to win a round but it's better to win lots of rounds uh so it's a really cool mechanism that's not i've 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 only seen it in a couple other games. <laughs> There's um, Sukimono, which kind of uses the same thing, but in a real-time game. But I can't think of a lot of other um, drafting games that do this. I guess that's what I'll call it. Um, really interesting. Strasbourg 2011. Three to five players, so it's not... It doesn't even try for the two. You really want it at the four or five level. Number 61 and last on our list is The Gallerist from 2015. It's a one to four player game from Vital Lacerda, who's fabulous. This was published by Eagle Griffin Games in this giant, big, spiffy packaging. Um, it is one of the larger games in my collection. It goes next to like Anachrony and the Venus Deluxe and like it's this giant box, um, which means for me, who likes to take the bus around town or walk if I can, uh, it's not quite as portable as a lot of games, so it doesn't really come with me a lot. Uh, but here at home, I like to teach it, or if I'm at a con or something, I'm happy to teach it. Um, what I love about The Gallerist, what's like really special about some of Vitale's games, is that it's a kind of a one-worker game, where you have a worker pawn and you kind of move once, on the board and you just keep moving. It's similar to like a Kanban that way where he really does a lot 
in a small space like that. Um, so the gallerist has these great like bumping mechanisms where if someone bumps you out of a space, you get an extra thing. So you have to like time everything where you can take advantage of getting bumped, but you also need to go places where people might bump you out. There's some beautiful artwork. Um, this is when I found out that Vital is actually a photographer. Who knew? Um, he put his own work in the game and I think that's just lovely. I really hope and 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 I think we have done an okay job of reaching out into the art community and finding some amazing artists to be designers or publishers or just artists, not just artists, but artists for games. Um, but you see people like uh, Ryan Lockett coming out and really just putting his own stamp on things. And I think Vital has a certain aesthetic and it was nice to see some of that come into his games. It personalizes it a little bit for someone who is is on social media but maybe not as much as some other people uh, well that's number four down if you're enjoying the the videos here and if you haven't seen some of them go ahead and check out the rest of the playlist otherwise we will see you with numbers 60 through 51 next week <laughs>